Hi everybody, my name is Jan Garrett and I am delighted to be here today with my dear friend and fellow musician Larry Gottlieb. We're going to be talking a lot about music in Aspen, but before we do that, and beyond, but before we do that I'm going to read a, a short little bio. So you, if you don't already know Larry, this is interesting stuff. It says, Larry Gottlieb completed his undergraduate work in physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1967 and his master's degree in X-ray astronomy at the University of California, San Diego in 1969. After participating actively in the anti-Vietnam War movement in San Diego, he moved to Aspen, Colorado in 1970 and began a 20-year career in the music business. So far, so good. So far, so good. <laughs> Let me go on, because this is really cool. <clears throat> in 1972, he found himself inquiring into the nature of consciousness and its relationship to the world we live in. Two years later, he had a profound experience that forever altered his view of how consciousness and the physical world are related. Since then, he has endeavored to explain why the world shows up the way it does. He says that, in doing so, I have experienced within myself the power to determine the quality of my own life. <laughs> <laughs> wow! We want to hear more about that for sure. Um, so I don't know, Larry, where to begin exactly. I mean, you've been involved in music in Aspen for a long time. So well, where my, shall we begin? Yeah, my music... <laughs> Uh, uh, began in my mother's womb. She was a violinist in Los Angeles. She was uh, on many, many movie soundtracks from the 50s and 60s. And wow. in uh, 1967, she was, no, 57, she was hired to teach and perform in the Aspen Music Festival, which oh, is wow. how we got here. Oh, cool. And I was a little kid. I mean, I was 11 years old, and, and, and that sounded like fun. And and being in Aspen in the 50s was, was awesome. I mean, it was a, there was one paved road in town and, wow. and, and no stoplight that I recall. And, and it was, you know, it was, it was just swimming and going to the, to the uh, soda fountain after swimming in the Jerome Pool. And, wow. And, you know, a certain amount of camping and hiking and horseback riding and all that stuff. Wow. And uh, so that was my introduction to, to Aspen. And um, I spent those 12 summers here with her, and then I moved to Aspen in 1970, as the bio says. And uh, I moved uh, to Aspen to start playing folk music, actually, with a friend of mine named Jack Hardy, who was a, a folk hero in, in, uh, in the back east, uh, yeah, and to right. some degree in Aspen. Yeah. And um, then I met you and, and, and Vic <laughs> yeah. Garrett, and... Right. Um, John Summers, and we put our first band together, and gosh, it was wonderful. And, it was and wonderful, and that was the band called? That was Liberty. That was the first version of Liberty. Yeah, and so it's interesting to me. So your mother was a, a concert violinist and very famous all over the world, but did you have like formal musical um, education, or what was that well, like? Well, I took piano you? lessons and, <laughs> and acoustic guitar lessons, but uh -huh. no, I wouldn't call it formal. My grandfather, my mother's father, was in the Buffalo Symphony, and he was a violinist, and he taught. He was mom's first teacher, mm -hmm. and there's this thing about about a lineage, you know. Right. If if the if the grandfather passes the talent uh, and the impetus to study the way it has to be studied in order to play the violin right. at that scale. Um, it was it was thought that maybe that lineage would pass on to me. Yeah. Um, she mom put a, a, a half size violin in my hands when I was like four. Wow. And um, subsequently took it back <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, pronounced me off the hook. Oh. Um, I'm not sure what she said, but um, right. I think the message was you don't really have it. But you have something. Inherent. Sure. Right. Of course, you grew up with that. So yeah. there's always been music in yeah. you. And dad was a cellist. I mean, okay. I've only mentioned mom, but dad right. was a cellist. And so I, yeah. I have to some degree genes and also a, 
uh, I have a really good ear. Um, I think so, yeah. You know, and and I can hear differences in pitch that that what mom used to say. Uh, one of her students would play a chord, and she would say, "It's a C D and an F sharp, but the D is flat." Oh. You know, and I mean, it, it was as astonishing to me how she could do that, and she had perfect pitch. I don't have that, but I have a really good relative ear. You sure do. Yeah. You sure do. And your first instrument, would, would you say that that was guitar? No, it was piano. Oh, piano. Yeah. But then when you started playing folk music or that sort of thing, it was guitar? Well, or all during my high school time, I was listening to electric guitar. I was listening oh, wow. to surf music. I was listening to the Ventures oh, wow. in particular. And I, I have always been... A, the sort of musician that wanted to replicate the sound that I uh -huh. heard. Uh -huh. So the first sound that I heard was that I wanted to do that with was a Fender guitar uh, playing surf music with all oh, this wow. reverb and all that. Yeah. And I asked my parents if the, if I could do that if they and and my father was really a purist and so he said essentially no. No. And so. Um, I studied piano, and later on, I studied uh, guitar with a Spanish guitarist in Los wow. Angeles. Uh, but I never got that electric guitar until I graduated high school. I got uh -huh. one as a as a uh, high school graduation gift, and then I went off to MIT and I joined a fraternity. And there were a couple guys there who I am still in close touch with, whom I dearly loved, and they had good voices. Oh. So when the latest Beatles record came out, right. I would go buy it, bring it back to the frat house, and we and I would learn the chords and, uh -huh. and George Harrison's guitar licks, and then I would teach Michael and Barry the the harmonies or the, the vocal parts, oh, cool. and then we would perform for the fraternity. Oh, I, so I love that. That was 65 through 67. But did you sing yourself? Yeah, I sang okay. as a member of a vocal trio. I never sang lead <laughs> yeah. unaccompanied or otherwise. Yeah. I still don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an incredible backstory to get to Aspen. Um, again, because Larry and I uh, and my former husband, Vic Garrett, um, started playing in this band we called Liberty. We were joined by John Summers, and that's when the four of us, first it was Jan and Vic, no, Vic and Jan. Then, it, then when Larry started playing, it was Vic and Jan and Larry. And then when John Summers started sitting in, we thought, that's a great sound, but Vic and Jan and Larry and John. Cumbersome. A cumbersome name. Yeah. So, um, how did we come up with the name Liberty? You remember? It was an old uh, fiddle tune, and right. John Summers uh, came to us with a wealth of fiddle tunes in right. his repertoire. Right. And uh, I think it came down to two it came down to Liberty and Gold Rush. Oh. And there were these other folks in town, and they were watching us, and we chose Liberty, and they said, okay, we'll take Gold Rush. I didn't, well, there's a bit of history I didn't That's know. That's my memory of it. Wow, I'll go with that. My memory is like a steel sieve, so only the important things stick out to me. Um, one thing that I'm really interested in is that once, for example, Liberty started, and there were a lot of other great bands in town, or people beginning to form great bands in town, starting again like at the beginning of the 70s, and all through the 70s, um, as we were playing music, I just felt like there was a sense of, there's something really special happening in Aspen um, with the music, but also kind of the family that we all were involved in of other musicians, right? Would you say that? I or? would say that. Yeah. And, and uh, it was astonishing the wealth of talent that came through Aspen, musical right. talent that came through Aspen. And I started with the Aspen Music Festival because it started with classical, but it, right. but also jazz. That's right. And and there were jazz bands, and uh, and I remember some of that. Yeah. Uh, and bluegrass, and right. blues, and, and later country. Yeah. Well, folk, as I mentioned before. So there were lots of these threads, and, and the people who came through were Amazing. Some yeah. of them went on to be luminaries, you yeah. know, John Denver and yeah. 
and the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band and right. and uh, the Eagles uh, put together their first record in Aspen. Wow. It was a magical place. It was a magical place and a magical time. Indeed. So I guess what I'm trying to get down to was what what was the sort of impetus behind that for you? Um, was it just the music? Was it something that inspired the music and the playing? Was I mean, what was that? I Can think you... it was just what we what we wanted to do, what we were called to do. Wow. I mean, I felt it as um, I felt it as something that I couldn't not do. You know, it was <laughs> I had whatever talent I had. Yeah. I had whatever instruments I had. Mm -hmm. I could hold my own in a in a band. I knew that from playing rock and roll in college. Right. And so it was just playing music with friends. Yeah. And at the time, it wasn't business. It right. wasn't serious it wasn't important it wasn't going somewhere it right. was just playing with friends and mm -hmm. and as i recall there was a whole lot of mixing and matching going on it's like yeah. oh we're doing this gig over here can you join us right. sure right and um i referred to the eagles putting together their first uh record in aspen and i remember john summers uh coming back to where we were playing with bernie ledden and saying, wow. you know, Bernie brought his banjo. He wants to play with us. Great. I didn't know who <laughs> Bernie Ledden was. Right. You know, but we played bluegrass Well, that what night did Bernie wonderful. Ledden go on to do? He, he went on to do lots of things. Well, he was one of the original Eagles. And okay. then he did the, was it the Burrito Brothers? Something <gasps> like that. And, and for a short period of time, he was with the Dirt Band. Okay. The Dirt Band. Right. And um, I don't know what the rest of his... That's okay. I what mean, has, what the rest of what he did was. Yeah, but the idea kind of is that everybody was happy to sit in with everybody else yeah. and just whatever whatever the the music called for. Yeah. Or that particular song. Yeah. Would call for. And yeah. I remember I remember people saying uh, or discovering that oh these guys have a gig. Right. These guys are playing. Guys and gals are playing over there. Uh -huh. Let's take a break and go listen to them. Exactly. And they would show up on their break. And it was this <laughs> wonderful, wonderful assemblage of, of, of free spirit talent, musical talent. Uh -huh. Later on, it started to get serious. And it started right. to be, well, we could actually do something with this. Right. And it wasn't so much fun for me anymore. Uh-huh. Would that be kind of by the time we were... Because Liberty started playing... Well, Liberty was playing at a lot of places in town, including the Red Onion. And the And the Blue Moose. Moose. Yeah. And um, Jake's Abbey, I think, maybe? Yes. Yeah. Right. Jake's Abbey was a subterranean club. <laughs> and uh, uh, I remember very clearly, uh, oh, let's play Jake's. Oh, we need a piano. Oh, oh, how are we going to get the piano down those <laughs> stairs into Big exactly. Exactly. I don't remember what happened, but I remember that standing on the sidewalk saying, right. how are we going to get this piano down? And I don't think we ever did, as a matter of fact. I don't fact. remember. So, so yeah. we had to rely more on our guitars than our you know, yeah. bass and whatever else happened. Wow. And then John Denver showed up at one point and listened to our band and liked the band. And I think at that point, he invited us to come and do an opening act at something. Well, first he invited us to New York to play on his uh, Farewell Andromeda album. And uh, John Summers had written a song called uh, River of Love. Yeah. And I, I remember we were rehearsing at the Blue Moose, which was also downstairs, and we took a break, and I went up the stairs to the sidewalk to maybe go get a cup of coffee or something, and there right. was John. Uh -huh. And this was a time where John, this was a time when John Denver could walk down the sidewalk, right. and, uh, and uh, everybody would leave him alone. And uh, he said, I heard you guys the other night, and who wrote that song? And I said, John Summers. And he said, I... I I'd like to record that song. I said, well, we're all downstairs. Come on down. So I turned around and brought John down, John down with me. And uh, three days later, we were in New York recording the song. So it was, uh, it was magical. And you couldn't, I mean, if you wrote this script, everybody would roll their eyes. But it just, stuff happened that yeah. you couldn't predict. Yeah. 
And, and going on with the John Denver theme, uh, we did become opening act at, for a lot of his uh, th th places that he was playing with larger audiences, yeah. et cetera, yeah. going on into the sort of earlier 70s, 73. 73, 74, 74 75. 75. We did a six-week nationwide tour with him, That's opening right. for him. Um, I think the largest crowd we played for on that tour was like 22,000 people. Oh, my God. And I remember um, <laughs> uh, being on stage with, this, with the lights, um, you couldn't see beyond the fourth or fifth row. Right. And it's, so you could sort of pretend that it was a small crowd until the applause <laughs> happened. Right. And then it kind of hit you in the chest, you know. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I, remember, I remember that real clearly. But that was really fun, and we were taken care of. It was kind of first class. It was. You know, we got to fly uh, from city to city on a very fancy uh, private jet, as I remember, and staying in pretty pretty great hotels and stuff. Yeah, right. It was, it was first class. It was first class, and it was like it was like stardom or something like that. And I remember going, "Wow, man, this is great!" and you know, we'd eat out at cool places and, you know, all that stuff. Not realizing, of course, no one was really the business part of our band, that everything that we did would then later be subtracted from the money they gave us up front. Well, and right? I remember uh, we went to visit with John before the tour, and he wanted to know, okay, how much is this going to cost me to have you guys? Oh. Which was a topic we had not discussed. Right. And so nobody said anything. And he said, okay, I'll pay you $500 a show. For all of us? Yeah. Larry, I don't remember this. Hey. It's a good thing I don't remember that. That's okay. what he said. If we had oh. talked about it in advance, I think it would have been a different number. Right. And we didn't know. I mean... The innocence. The innocence. The innocence. And that was my point before. Yeah. I mean, it was just fun. Yeah. It was a time in our lives where we, where we were just blessed to be able to do what we love to do with people right. that we love to do it with right. and, and, and make some money at it. Make some money, meaning pay the rent right. and, and eat and all that right. stuff. My rent in downtown Aspen in 1972 or three was... It was seventy five dollars a month. Wow. Well, that would be that, and that again is something to pay attention to because that's like we could all feel free to play music and be with other people and have fun because because we could afford to live here. Yeah. And as time went on, and as more and more people discovered this beautiful paradise of Aspen, the rents went up, and there were fewer places to play because the clubs couldn't afford. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Yeah, and then we went on from there. Um, you, I mentioned there was a place in your bio um, where you mentioned that there was something happened. <clears throat> excuse me, something happened that changed your consciousness. Now I will mention that in that early part of the '70s, um, I some friends that we knew. In fact, the, the band Gold Rush yeah. came through. And these guys had um, had discovered. Uh, an Indian teacher, a guru, and they had learned how to do certain meditation techniques. And at that point, um, like in probably night 72 or something, I thought that would be a great idea for me. And I, I ended up going through all the steps that I needed to go through so that I too could, you know, get those techniques or be, receive <clears throat> those techniques and the energy behind them from a long lineage of um, Indian masters, actually, that's what it was. Because at that time, you couldn't just waltz into a bookstore or a library and get a book about how to do meditation from a long line of masters of, you know, you couldn't do that. No. So you really had to go, you know, to the source. I did that, and then I think I kind of turned you guys I on. watched you do it. Yeah. And I thought, okay, this looks good. I'll, I'll try that as well. And, and that was in 1973. Wow, okay. Yeah. So, so you, he, are, you already had that inner connection going on. Well, yeah. There was something about watching you, Jan, uh, d learn these techniques and then watching you 
day by day, and we saw each other every day in those right. days, and right. just watching how you progressed in your utilization of those techniques and what they did for you and how you were right. you were coming out of yourself, you know, the way, and I wanted that as well. Right. So I did that, uh, I learned those techniques as well. Yeah, and then you had all sort of other experiences, you mentioned that in your bio, Yeah. that let you know what? Hmm, that let <laughs> me know that my understanding of of what the of how the world works and what a human being is was hmm. completely inadequate to explain oh. my experience. Um, yeah. I've written about that extensively. I don't want to try to tell that whole story no, here. No, you don't have to. Uh, but I've it's that story is in both the books that I've already published. Can you tell me the name of the books? Just well, the first one is called The Seer's Explanation, uh -huh. and the second one is called Hoodwinked. And Great hoodwinked, books, by the way. Great books. Hoodwinked yeah. refers to my discovery or my the the awareness that settled in in me that we, growing up in our culture, uh, bought into a whole bunch of stuff that isn't real. Right. And uh, when you're walking around trying to deal with something that isn't real, it, it sort of conjures, you know, Don Quixote. Uh, tilting at windmills. It's like it's not very effective. It doesn't really get you where you're trying to go. Okay. So uh, I think we've all been hoodwinked in that respect. And May I just stop you there? Did, sure. did your training as a as a physicist help at all with this? Or? It did. And I'm writing about that and have written about that rather extensively. Um, you know, I I in earning those degrees in physics that you uh, read about in the bio, um, I took courses in quantum mechanics, which, which is the bedrock of what every physics student learns. And it was really interesting to me, uh, but, but after a while, it, it, it didn't evoke enough juice or passion in me right. to continue. Mm -hmm. Decades later, when I started to have experience that showed me that the world isn't what it looks like. It isn't, right. you, you can't understand the world by reducing it to its smallest component parts because when you get down to that scale, the whole thing just kind of turns into uh, a, a, an energy soup that it's right. like, well, how do we get objects out of that? You know? Right. So, and then I started reading about quantum mechanics because it seemed like that would be relevant. And as I did that, years, decades after I earned those degrees, it was like, oh, mm -hmm. I see. Okay. I see how these two things relate. Awesome. I see how that, that discipline of quantum physics and what I've experienced and what I am experiencing in meditation and in, in, uh, in trying to answer my question of, how does this all work right, anyway? Right. Uh, they started to fit together beautifully, and I thought, oh, okay. I see why I left the physics back all that distance in the past because right. I had to have some experience, mm -hmm. uh, personal experience, right. in order to to assimilate all that. Wow. Right. And as as well, this is my experience, songwriting especially, but even playing music to get to that point where. When you're in the thick of, uh, of singing, playing, performing, and there's an audience out there, there's a sense of, I would say, just a, a camaraderie, an energy exchange that yes. happens. And that's my experience that knowing that and, and, and finding out how to get into that place where the way I would say it for myself is that um, it's not like I'm up in stage kind of showing off. and It's like, how can I be an instrument for what I know is is this universal energy, this this kind of consciousness, however you'd say that, that incredible, the the essential invisible heart of all creation. You know, how can I let that come through? I've heard you talk about that for <laughs> decades. And, and what comes up for me when I hear you do that is, yes, and you have to discover how to get out of the way for that to happen. Exactly. And yeah. I observed you, have observed you over these, all these years, 
getting out of the way in a profound manner wow. that uh, I'm still working on. Oh, wow. I'm still working on getting out of the way. I still get up on stage to play with people and I, I have to work at getting out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow, as soon as I get up there and get tuned up and all that, it, I find myself in, in a place that could be labeled like, this is somehow about me and whether I'm up to this and right. whether I can do this and whether I deserve to be here. And all of that noise yeah. is right in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I have to, I have to spend some time getting that out of the way right. so that I can be the instrument that you just mentioned. Right. And I've always admired you for just mm -hmm. being able to get up there and do that. Yeah. Um, uh, whereas I feel like I have to work at it. I think it's, it takes a lot of practice. Yeah. And I think for anybody who is a musician or aspires to be a musician or a performer of any kind, even a speaker or a teacher, I suppose, um, it takes a lot of practice. It does. And, um, and time. And courage. And courage. And willingness to, <laughs> to fall flat on your face, yeah. which occurs sometimes. Oh, God. When you lose your train of thought or you yes. forget the words. or. Yeah start the song in the wrong key or and I've done all of that. <laughs> and that so. has happened. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it has to be, you have to get to where that's okay. Exactly. So all this time that Larry and I have been talking, we're trying to get to the, the center, the core, or what I'll just say is Larry, what else do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will, I want people to feel and hopefully you all feel the love <laughs> that we share. And, um, yeah. and also, uh, in our recounting of those days in the seventies, uh, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to get back in touch with that feeling of doing what you love to do yeah. unencumbered by society's rules and, and, uh, strictures about what you're supposed to, how you're supposed to do it and where you're supposed to do it and right. what you're supposed to be doing it for and how much you're supposed to be getting paid and mm -hmm. all that. I mean, all of that is part of life. It's mm -hmm. all, it's, there's nothing wrong with that, right. but there's also this thing about how it feels to, to get together with people that you love and do what you both, what you all love to do. And that's a, an opportunity that we were given back then yeah. uh, that uh, for me, once in a while it comes back, but it certainly not with the focus and the length of time that we were blessed to enjoy that back right. in the 70s. Right. And would you say that when you're in that place, I mean, people talk a lot about... Um, athletes or artists or musicians getting in the zone. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that's what you're talking about? Yeah, kinda? and I think getting in the zone involves getting out of the way. Right. Uh, you don't have to go anywhere to get in the zone. You just have to be who you are and mm -hmm. allow all that noise that I was talking about before mm -hmm. to, to subside. Mm -hmm. And there are many techniques for doing that. You right. know, uh, uh, I don't know that I sit down at my pedal steel on stage and, and, and meditate per se right. with quotes around the word, but somehow you have to bring yourself back to the center. Yeah. You have to bring yourself back to knowing that, Hey, this is it. This is me. Yeah. This is what I got. Right. Warts and all, as they say, right. and here you go. And I find that when I do that, it doesn't even matter if I make mistakes or start right. songs in the wrong key or right, something like right, that, right. because the audience is, is allowed to relax and enjoy what they're doing as well. And that's yeah. why they came there. That's great. That's great. I love that. So would you say, yeah, when you're in that zone place, you don't have to think about what you look like or because, again, you're getting out of the way and something's coming through. Yeah. In the moment. Yes. And let me add one thing. Yeah. The instrument that I play, the pedal steel guitar, yeah. is a very complex machine. Yeah. If I think about it, I'm toast. Oh. If I if I think about, all right, how do I lower that string or how do I raise this one to change yeah. the chord, the song's over already. Oh wow. You know, you have to be in the moment to play that instrument. You can't have all that stuff going on mm -hmm. and pay attention to it. It can sort of nibble back here, but right. it has to stay back there. But you would have to have practiced 
in advance. Yeah, well, the last 50 years have accomplished <laughs> that, you know, at least to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. It's practicing the instrument, and if the instrument is this, it's practicing that as sure. well. Yeah. yeah, you have to gain a certain level of competence yeah. in in transferring what's what you hear within yourself yeah. into what your hands and your voice and all that do. Right. But at some point, you have to let all that go right. and just be in the moment and do what you do. Right, right. So for me, I will just say as we end this particular segment to just invite all of you guys and give you a sense of um, hope, encouragement to find that what is it that you really love? You know, some people might say like, if you're doing a vision quest, they might say, what is it that you came here to do? Not, it doesn't have to be just one thing, but what's the direction of that? What is it that you get passionate about? What it is that feels easy, that feels um, generous to do? Maybe, and, yeah. then, and then do that. And you deserve to do that. <sighs> you don't have to earn the right to do yeah. that. You don't have to know the right people in order to do that. <sighs> you deserve to do it just by virtue of who you are. Oh, what a relief. So... Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all you guys. Stay in touch. <laughs> <laughs>